Welcome to the Courage to Lead Summit, where we reveal the secrets to successful leadership and creating monumental growth, joy, and impact in your life. I'm your host, Kaisa Siipilehto, the founder of Livia Joy Limited and Courage to Lead Community, and a certified leadership coach with a 10-year corporate experience in marketing. So the past years, I've been helping impact-driven experts, leaders, and entrepreneurs from over 20 nationalities around Europe and the Americas to transform their careers, businesses, and lives. So this inspired me to put together this summit. So the purpose is to give you the key strategies and tools to engage with your vision and find the essential focus areas to create the growth and impact you want to see in this world. Therefore, I have forward-looking leadership experts, well-experienced consultants and coaches, business and startup advisors, best-selling authors, and team leaders sharing their knowledge and insights with you. So today, I have the pleasure to discuss with James M. Kerr. Um, he's a consultant, coach, keynote speaker, author, and columnist. He has consulted to and coached leaders at many well-known organizations, including the Home Depot, Big Accenture, Mitsumi Sumitomo, and General Dynamics, to name a few. Jim is an expert in the development and implementation of multi-phase change initiatives centered on vision and strategy, culture, redesign, and organizational effectiveness. His works have earned several industry awards, including the highly renowned Global Guru's Top 30 Organizational Culture Award in 2022, and uh, well-known several Twink Thinkers 360 Top 10 Worldwide Thinkers Awards. His latest book, Indispensable, Build and Lead a Company Customers Can't Live Without, uh, in released by Humanix Books 2022, has garnered rave reviews by business leaders and the trade press as well. Indeed, Jin enjoys forcing new ideas and devising practical solutions to clients, broadly relevant business pro problems, while shape shifting them into opportunities for their success. Jim holds two business degree degrees and his strong dedication to research, study and cultivation through leadership enables Jim to continue to deliver cutting edge solutions to his clients. I wanted to interview James uh, as he has a wide perspective on leadership and business development. So I'm very glad to have you with us today. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, uh, Kaisa. I, I really feel um, honored to be part of the summit this week. Yes, I'm so glad that we get to connect and, and share ideas. Uh, I'm based now in Europe and you're in US, so we, we are having this very global summit. So it's, um, <laughs> we are very lucky. If some, some good things from the COVID that it feels like the world is getting smaller at the same time. Sure does, yeah. I would like to start by asking you, what does success mean to you? Uh, great question. You know, for me, it's always been about being able to be myself and to do the things that uh, I find value in and that I enjoy doing um, without any regard to, you know, the outcomes. If you can live that way, I think you can have a successful life. I think you can have a successful business career. <laughs> yes, I like that. I'm really enjoying what, what do you do. <laughs> Um, you've done many things as I, I uh, introduced yourself and your, your experience helping very, very different companies as well. What would you say that has been the most successful for you so far? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm very proud to be able to uh, say that I've never done an engagement that wasn't successful. So really whatever the leadership team that I'm working with is trying to accomplish, uh, we've been able to accomplish. I would say though, if you were to ask me like, what was the, the one big thing that really helped to launch the business and so on, I'd have to say it would be the publication of my very first book. Um, 
and that was many, many years ago. I hate to admit that, but um, you know, back in uh, the late 1980s, the IRM imperative came out and it was well received and people started to reach out to me. And the next thing I know, I was running a consulting business. So to me, you know, writing and getting some thought leadership out there was a big step forward in launching what is now indispensable consulting. What made you to write that book back then? Um, you know, I had done an awful lot in sort of the data management space, and it was an emerging space at that time. Uh, even concepts like data warehouse were brand new. People were just starting to think about what that meant. Uh, I was with a leading life insurance company. It's now part of AXA. Um, and people were calling me anyway to speak at you know events and to talk about some of the theories that I'd been working on with the company. So I thought, why not write a book? And, and that's really what inspired me to do that. Yeah, a small project to take on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. What did it give you to... to to first, first of all, start start writing the book and then seeing when it's uh, launched and received well, what did it personally give you? Well, again, I mean, it opened all kinds of opportunities up because like I said, people were willing to uh, pay uh, for me to come and help them with their strategies. So it, it was uh, really the start of the consulting business for me. And then from there, I didn't never look back. It, and I've been doing this for over 30 years now. So it's, it's been a, um, it's been a great ride and, you know, we wouldn't really wouldn't have done it any other way. Yeah. Like you said in the beginning, like, uh, all your engagements has been very successful and your projects, what would you say is a key element for you to make those, uh, customer engagements? and the project's very successful? I think there's really two things. I mean, at first, you want to be able to make sure you're really listening and understanding what the client's trying to accomplish. I think a lot of times consultants get a bad reputation because they come in and they do it their way instead of really listening to the client and trying to understand the problem that really needs to be solved. And sometimes the client doesn't articulate that very well. So you've got to ask some good questions and you've got to be able to really try to understand and hear and, and read between the lines so that you can get a good understanding of what success looks like from a client perspective. Because after all, you know, the client defines whether it works or not, not you as a provider of service. And I would say the second thing is um, you really want to make sure you get into co-creation. You, you can't just come in and take over a place. I know some of the larger firms love to just plug dozens and sometimes more than that uh, uh, of their people into an account and really kind of take over the, the entire operation that they're working on. I prefer to work with the experts from the client organization and build a team of those people um, so that when the answers get developed, these people have pride of ownership. They, they know that they were part of devising this solution mm -hmm. that ultimately gets implemented. So buy-in and, and acceptance of recommendations becomes a whole lot easier when someone's co-creating those rather than having a consultant come in and just give you the answer. It's not, if it's not your answer, you may not like it. Yeah, I bet the motivation is very different when it comes from the in, inside. Right. like you described um having like you said you've done this for 30 years already and and um starting when you were starting your career what would have been useful to know like what would you tell to your younger self today um <laughs> uh, you know I, I guess i would just say you know give yourself a break i i think i put a lot of pressure on myself early on um and I worked long and hard and, you know, looking back at that now, I'm not sure if it was particularly necessary. I think I was, you know, trying to make sure that um, 
you know, I was able to to get everything done that needed to be done. I, I know my just as an example, my very first year in business, there are, are basically if, if you take out weekends and holidays, there's basically 280 billable days in a year. I build. 263 days my first year in business so <laughs> it's, it was uh an awful lot and i'd wake up in a hotel room and not know what city i was in because sometimes i would be in three cities in a week hmm. so you know sort of what i'd probably the advice i'd give myself um then would be take it easy you'll be fine just keep doing what you're doing yes this is i guess especially as a starting entrepreneur very difficult to find that harmony like how much to put effort and then also to to relax uh, and mm -hmm. i i sadly just noticed uh, a friend of mine posted that he had to go to er because like his heart was saying yeah. that your body needs to stop and i think that's uh for for many entrepreneurs the case that we kind of go over the limit that then our mm -hmm. body like shuts down so what would what would you advise uh to those who really just want to build build and strive forward to also find that uh harmony to to balance well i mean i think everybody's different in that regard but i i do think that um you have to pace yourself and recharging your batteries are an important part of being able to bring your best effort forward when you're doing work, you know, with or for a client. So you've got to give yourself the time to recharge. And if you're constantly on the go, I mean, like I said, that first year I was in an airport every week. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I've learned to politely say no to a lot of things that don't, you know, fit into my schedule anymore so <laughs> being able to do that i think is a, is a way to to sort of manage the um the onslaught oh. of opportunities because the opportunities are there it's really more about how do you want to pursue those and which ones are more interesting to you and, and which ones would you pass on because they just don't fit with what you're doing right now or they yeah. don't seem as interesting as maybe some other opportunities what are you looking at when you look at the possibilities? How do you know when to say no and when to pursue that opportunity? Well, I mean, for me, it's always been about, you know, learning something new. I, I really get energized by new ideas. So if I've got uh, an opportunity to work on something that I haven't worked on before, then bring it on. That's the kind of stuff that stretches me, makes me stronger, makes me more you know intrigued by the possibilities and so on so I, I like to continue to learn and and i love you know opportunities uh for engagements that are going to bring me into a new space or, or get me to think about something that i've already worked on in a different way yes and now that the world is changing a lot uh, and growing yeah. growing fast there is so much opportunities to learn um what would you say now talking about growth and learning is uh, where would you like to be better at in which area and how would you develop that? Well, I think I'll use an analogy, maybe a sports analogy. I play golf and I I'm probably the weakest part of my game is is um, sand traps. So I've got to get better at being able to hit the ball out of a sand trap. And um, I'm in the process of doing that. And how do I do it? I practice, you know, I get in the sand trap and I drop 50 balls and I hit 50 balls and I get comfortable in the sand and I fine tune my swing and, you know, I'm getting better and it's through practice. And I would say the same holds true in business, you know, whatever you're trying to get better at, you need time to practice and, and work on. And, and at this point in my career, I mean, the stuff that I'm doing, I'm doing, you know, it's, it, you know, uh, there is, <laughs> there isn't any particular weak spot or anything like that, that, that I'm, uh, uh, I'm really focused on, but rather, you know, just making sure that I continue to stay up on what's going on and, and forge an opinion that's worth hearing and then work with clients to kind of help them apply what I know to solve their problems. 
how do you let's go there to, uh, working with your clients and helping especially those teams and and leaders um what would you say that are the key elements that you and the leaders want to focus on these days well i mean you know i'm proud to say that i'm one of the the top 10 thinkers according to thinker 360 in in future of work and i think future of work is a uh timely topic right now as we start to get back into workspaces or in a more, I don't know, more traditional work routine. People are, um, you know, getting back into the office at some, in, with some regularity now. And that's going to continue, I think, as we continue to learn how to live with this, uh, this disease that we discovered a couple of years ago. So I think future of work and, and work setting and organization design and culture are all things that um, clients are interested in, in working on and, and improving. And I've got, like I say, a ton of experience with that. I've written books on it. I've got 500 published articles out there in the trade press. So they come to me for ideas about how to do that. But if you would name, let's say, one aspect, let's... Um let's speak the culture because i think we are both yeah. passionate about that okay. um why, let's listen to the clients first why what is their like biggest like let's say struggle or challenge at the moment in terms of building that culture that leads to well, successes yeah i mean i think you know prior to um let's say march of 2020 everyone's top leadership teams had their their businesses all those businesses have culture whether it's deliberately designed or not is a question but uh, like it or not they all had a, a given um, culture now all of a sudden you know worldwide pandemic hits and all of the assumptions and thoughts we had about what it means to go to work changed <clears throat> And as a consequence, I think now as people are starting to get back into a more, like I say, traditional way of going about work, where there's typically a hybrid environment of some sort, where you've, you know, if you've got the flexibility um, to work remotely, you, people are doing that, um, and some people are coming into the office. So the challenge now is how do we recast the culture so that we can accommodate this new way of doing work. So that's the problem or the challenge. And then in regard to recasting the culture, you know, I've got a methodology that I bring to the table to help clients do that. And, and that's what we'll do. We'll bring the, the methodology in, we'll form a team around me, uh, like I say, co-creation. So that's what that means is get a team of people from within the company to work with me on, on this. We apply the methodology and come up with solutions and plans and so on to recast the culture so that it fits with the way we're going to go to work from now on. Yes. Can you share a little bit more about the, the framework with us or is it is it your your secret? Well, it's a secret, but I'll share it with you if you promise not to tell anyone. <laughs> Shh, listeners. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's a really straightforward approach. You know, the very first step is to understand what the leadership team is trying to accomplish and what their business is about, what they see as opportunities and challenges and so on, because you really want the culture to be aligned with the strategic objectives of the organization. So the first part of the approach is to interview the leadership team and get a, a full understanding of what they're seeing as the future. And then with that, we go into a baseline step where we basically um, characterize the current culture with all its warts and blemishes and understand what's currently going on. Um, and then the next part is visioning, which is really, you know, sort of writing a story about what the culture should be like in the future. And then we do a gap analysis. We compare the baseline to the, to the vision. 
and see where the gaps are. And then we translate those gaps into projects and programs that have to get done over the course of time to move the organization from where it is today to where it wants to be in the future. And that's ultimately the, the transformation plan. Oh. And that's the basic approach. And we kind of bookend it with a, um, an administrative step where you define what the governance is going to be for that plan that you just created. And again, this is all done in unison with uh, staffers from inside the organization that I'm working with. Yes, I'm especially intrigued to hear more about how you engage the, the members of the organization to, to this work. Yeah, I mean, so it, it kind of happens at different levels. I mean, you, you're engaging the top uh, leadership through the interview process. You're engaging your team because they're assigned to work with you on the project. You're soliciting inf inf input from various levels of the organizations through workshops or, or uh, survey instruments, et cetera. We use a bunch of different things to kind of help us develop the, both the baseline and the target vision. So, yeah, you know, engagement's a big part of the process that, that I use, and it's done in a variety of different ways, mostly by, you know, getting people involved in, in building the solution with me. And, and then that's my code word for co-creation. Yes, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear from you. Um, when you interview the, the leaders at, at first to get, get the idea of what they want to accomplish, what's their vision, um, I don't know if you do it in, in group or separately, but what I'm curious to know is like, do they have a unified like understanding of the vision or how often does it differ <laughs> yeah they differ and it's it's done in a one-on-one -on -one and, and i do that on purpose because um it's important that each person has an opportunity to sort of say what they think without feeling any pressure or concern about colleagues having maybe a different point of view it's my job you know as a consultant to to take those varying points of view and blend them together in a way that can be, you know, satisfying for all, all of them. And we spend time, you know, sort of um, taking the results of those interviews and then playing them back in a variety of different ways and, and making sure that there's, there's mutual agreement about um, what we're aiming for. And then once that's had, then we go into the baseline and the target and so on. Yes. Well, thank you for sharing this, this framework and uh, sure. uh, people can, of course, connect with you and, and find more about uh, more about that. Um, so if we think about, for example, like uh, you uh, again, more personally, um, having having seen and done a lot, what have you changed your mind about over the years? Um, interesting question. I, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if I can just point to one thing. I think, you know, I've evolved as a consultant. I've evolved the methodologies. I've evolved my thinking on a lot of different things. And, I, and, and as that happens, I tend to publish something. So I've got a new article or a new book or whatever, you know, the, the book behind me here in the corner is indispensable. That's the latest book. It's, it's book number six. I'm, I'm in the process of writing book number seven, and that's going to have reflections on uh, some of the sort of the way my thinking's evolved. So it's hard for me to really point to one thing that I really changed my, my thinking on. But I will say that what I really work on doing is making sure that I'm open to new ideas, that I'm listening that I'm, I'm understanding what, what's happening by, by really hearing what people are talking about. So there's usually a difference between the words that someone uses and what their meaning, their intended meaning is. I try to get to the meaning. And like I said earlier, it's, it's what energizes me. If you can give me a new idea that I hadn't thought of before, then I can work on that for weeks. You know, it's, it's, it's ideas are, are energizing to me. 
far more energizing, in fact, than maybe um, just hanging out with friends, you know, <laughs> while, while that's really nice and all that, you know, energy comes from me with, uh, with ideas. So if you can throw an idea my way that I hadn't considered, that's something that's powerful and that's something that tends to lead to good things, you know, down the road, you know, at a minimum, an article or something like that. Yes, let's go back to the listening because you uh, uh, mentioned that again, like how can you really understand what the person is saying, saying and the meaning behind it? And I've heard that, I think it was some study that um, when people, let's take values and as, as an example, um, people have very different um, definitions for the same values. I think it was like uh, only 5% of the people would have the same definition to the, that same same value, for example. Okay. So what helps you to really understand the meaning behind what your client is saying? Well, what I tend to do is, you know, I'll hear whatever it is there. Uh, communicating and then I tend to ask some questions just to verify that I'm understanding it appropriately and it's typically through those additional questions that you know newfound understanding emerges so a lot of times well, like I say what I find is the initial few minutes of explaining what the problem is is only part of it and when you get further into it you might see that there's political implications, you know, they're struggling to work as a team because there's different parochial interests that are, you know, shaping behavior. And if we're gonna create a winning culture, we're gonna have to normalize all those parochial interests and get them into a place where they're working together and rowing in the same direction and so forth. So it's just trying to, really truly understand the situation that the client finds themselves in so that I can then, you know, apply what I do and help them, you know, get better. Yes, that's the art of asking questions and how you can ask the kind of using different, different wording, like you said before, and asking from different angles about the same topic to maybe mm -hmm. like to dig deeper and find that like, the bottom line <laughs> pain yeah, the point real or yeah, yeah. The, the real real thing to yeah. to be persistent to to dig as as deep as you need to yeah you, you have to be willing to do that because a lot of times clients aren't even able to ask the right questions they're not even sure exactly how you can help them you know they they know they have a problem it's sort of like going to a doctor and saying, well, my elbow hurts. Well, we're going to have to do some tests to, do, to discover what's, what is it? Did you bruise your elbow? Did you strain a ligament in your elbow? Did you break a bone in your elbow? You know, there's all different reasons why your elbow hurts. And as a doctor, you got to ask different questions mm -hmm. and maybe do different tests to make sure that you can confirm what it is that's actually the root cause of the problem and then you can solve it yeah that's yeah. similar with consulting sometimes it's uh, not even the the most evident one i remember if we talk about this uh body <laughs> awareness and i went to a physiotherapy saying like you know my back is like uh, hurting mm. and then he found like it's actually my legs so it's yeah, not like sure. here yeah. but where does where's the root cause let's say and to, mm. so you need to go <laughs> go uh, yeah deeper. i mean I, what, what would ha would have happened if the person you were working with said oh you've got a back problem let's let's have an operation and see if we can fix your back mm. when it wasn't your back at all. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 that, and that's, that's the same kind of thing. And I see it all the time. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times over the 30 years I've been in practice that I've come in and cleaned up the mess of a consulting firm that was in with the client before me and they weren't able to, to develop the right solutions or they built this nice thick, you know, three inch binder full of, information that nobody uses mm -hmm. they spent millions of dollars for this 
and had no value. Mm. And then they, you know, like I say, the client will call me up and say, hey, look, here's our problem. My elbow hurts, you know, and <laughs> my back hurts. Yeah, <laughs> let's see if it's really the elbow right. or what's, what's behind it. Exactly. Yes. I yes. have the, the, the same in coaching because like you said, sometimes the client even don't know like what kind of help they need. They right. might know like, okay, this is the area, but then there right. might be something behind. So it's also, Absolutely. that's the, um, how we can help the client to even get the bigger understanding of the, the overall, what they right. want to accomplish. Well, Let's go to the leaders again and, and our listeners who would like to create a bigger impact in this world. What would you say that are the key areas to focus on today? Like we talked about, the, the world has changed and especially during the last years. Um, what do you find that is very, very important today? I, I, I mean, like, like you, I, I coach a fair amount and um, I would say the thing that I'm working on most recently with the group of folks that I'm coaching are, uh, here's two or three main things. One, one is you've got to be yourself. So authenticity is an important element of good leadership, because if you're faking it, people can see right through that. And if they see through it and they don't think you're being sincere and authentic, then they may not be following you. You know, so authenticity, being yourself is really important. Being deliberate is the second thing that I'm constantly working on is don't just wing it. Don't just show up today and figure out what you're going to do, but be reflective. Take some time to, to think about what, what's going on in the situations that you find yourself in. And then decide what kind of leadership styles, what types of leadership behaviors and practices you should bring to the problem so that you're effectively leading all the time. So, so that would be the second thing. So it's authentic, it's being deliberate. And then say lastly, and this is probably a, something that's always important, um, but it's, it's been particularly important um, during this, these last couple of years, and that's working on self-talk. I, I think you've got to really be aware of how you're talking to yourself because that impacts the way you're dealing with other people. And if you're really, you know, uh, being negative, if you're really saying the kinds of things to yourself between your own two ears that you would never say to someone else, that's not good. That's not healthy. It's not going to help you become better. So try to flip that script that goes on between your ears all day long and work on work on being more positive, looking for opportunities to learn from mistakes and not, not be so hard on yourself when those things happen because, you know, business is not a game of perfect. You're never gonna do it perfectly. So mistakes are gonna happen. You're gonna have to learn to live with them. And if you can derive some other value beyond that, then that's a good thing. And that's something you can bring forward in your leadership style. That's a very powerful three and uh, many other speakers have also uh, made a note about this self-talk and I think it's the same, you know, like it, whether you're authentic leader and really there people can notice that and I think even the self-talk, like I notice like if I'm like not feeling very good my partner can definitely <laughs> notice that too even though they don't hear the words but you can sense the the energy the negativity in in others as well or doubts or whatever it is okay. so so that that reflects to to others as well so uh, do you have some uh, good techniques your your favorites how to work on that and manage that self-talk well, interestingly enough, you know, um, I've done a whole series uh, of pieces on it in LinkedIn. I've got videos and some articles in, in there. I actually, even in my podcast, The Indispensable Conversation, I had a, a retired National Football League football player on, and we we're talking about self-talk. And 
I think it starts with awareness. Like the very first step is understand that you're talking to yourself all day long. A lot of people don't realize that, mm -hmm. right? So first step is awareness. And then, then the second step is listening. You know, what are you hearing yourself say to you, you know, and is that message good? And then I think that's really sort of that third step is analysis. Is the, it, it, am I saying things that are positive, that are reinforcing good behavior, good, good thinking? Um, because that's, that's uh, where it all begins is between the ears, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of that, those steps. And then I think the last step, of course, is to change it, change the, the language, change the uh, thinking that you're providing yourself all day and try to find, you know, there's a, there's something to be learned. It's not all bad or, you know, we can do this or yeah, it didn't work the way I wanted to, but I'm going to stick with it because I think the next time it will work, and, you know, that kind of stuff. And just trying to change the way you're talking to yourself. But it starts, like I say, with awareness. Yeah. And, yeah. And, like and everything. Really, yeah. You've got to just, if you want to fix something, you've got to decide to fix it. As simple as that. Yes. You've mentioned a lot of resources as well that you provide podcasts and you have plenty of books and the new ones are coming as, as well. Uh, where would you like to direct our listeners? I know you have put together some giveaways. So would you like to tell more about that? Yeah, I've got a little ebook on culture. Uh, it's really the return on investment uh, for culture work. That's a question I get quite a bit from clients. You know, you, you know, they'll ask me, well, this is going to cost some money. You know, is it worth it? How do we measure the value of what you're doing? So I've answered that question so many times, I decided to put it in an ebook. And I know you've got the link that people can use to download it. Um, they just follow that link. Uh, we'll ask them for their name and email and stuff like that so that they register for the newsletter. And with the newsletter, they get the download of the ebook that talks about the ROI for culture transformation. Yes, that's a fascinating. I just talked to uh, Jean and we talked about like how investing in your learning will pay off and um, how, you know, how companies should give time for the people to learn during their day to yeah. also retain the talent. What would mm -hmm. you say if now very, very shortly, what's the return on investing in building your culture? Well, I mean, it, I, I've, I've listed, a, I think, eight, nine, ten different uh, ways to do it. But the, the very first question you've got to ask yourself is, you know, what's the value of alignment? What's the value of a satisfied workforce? What's the value of customers that prefer you over everyone else? You know, that's all culture. If you do a good job with your culture, you'll have happy employees, you'll have committed customers, you know, you'll have alignment between what you're trying to accomplish in your strategies and the way work gets done through the culture. So those are just a few of the ones that come to mind. There's a, there's a bunch more. Um, yeah, you know, but we'll make sure to, that everybody gets the link so they, they can download and get, get all the tips who are interested and willing to invest in that culture and seeing the results themselves. Um, as, a, as a final note, do you have something you want to share that we didn't cover in this interview yet? You know, I, I my, uh, again, this may, maybe comes from the coaching part of my, my practice, um, but get ready to do something. Don't just think about it. You, you know, dream big. That's great. It starts with a dream, but you've got to take that next step and actually do something about it. So if you want to try to achieve something big in your life, start doing it. Yes, there's no better time. <laughs> there's no yeah, tomorrow. I mean, it's, it's just today. Right. Well, if, yeah, I mean, if it's not if it's not now, then when? If it's not you, then who? You know, it's it, you've got to you got to get off of um, the thinking train and onto the doing train. You know, and I, and again, I'm not as someone that's 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 done a ton of strategic planning and vision work 
uh, for companies. Um, I'm not discounting the value of planning and, and, and envisioning the future, but you've actually got to take action. And that's why I see a lot of people sort of stumble, particularly pers on personal goals. You know, if I want to hit the ball out of the sand, I got to practice. <laughs> so it comes down to that, take action, so start doing it, stop thinking about it, start doing it. Yes. I think that's a good note to, to finish, like, let's go there and practice, see what sticks and what we in, enjoy. And if we want to rethink the vision or the goals, and then that comes by, by just trying it out. Right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for, for joining us and, and this summit. And I want to uh, recommend our, our viewers to go back to this interview, listen it again, and to also listen to our upcoming interviews with a lot of new, new tips and, and tools about many topics as well. So hopefully, Jim, will meet again and have uh, more conversations uh, around uh, building these winning cultures. Yes, it sure was fun. And thanks for inviting me to be part of your summit. Thank you so much. And until next time. So long.